Ezekiel chapter 16. I'll read a portion of the text. We'll undoubtedly cover more than what I read. Ezekiel chapter 16, beginning in verse 31. In that thou buildest thine intimate place in the head of every way, and makest thine high place in every street, and hast not been as an harlot, and that thou scornest higher. But as a wife that committed adultery, would take at strangers instead of her husband, they give gifts to all whores, that thou givest thy gifts to all thy lovers, and hirest them, that they may come unto thee on every side for thy whoredom. And the contrary is in thee from other women, in thy whoredoms, whereas none followeth thee to commit whoredoms, and in that thou givest a reward, and no reward is given unto thee, therefore thou art contrary. Wherefore, O harlot, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, because thy filthiness was poured out, and thy nakedness discovered through thy whoredoms with thy lovers, and with all the idols of thy abominations, and by the blood of thy children, which thou didst give unto them. Behold, therefore, I will gather all thy lovers with whom thou hast taken pleasure, and all them that thou hast loved, with all them that thou hast hated. I will even gather them round about thee, and I will discover thy nakedness unto them, that they may see all thy nakedness. And I will judge thee, as women that break wedlock and shed blood are judged. And I will give thee blood and fury and jealousy. And I will also give thee into their hand, and they shall throw down thine intimate plates, and shall break down thy high places. They shall strip thee also of thy clothes, and shall leave thy fair jewels, and leave thee naked and bare. They also shall bring up a company against thee, and they shall stone thee with stones, and thrust thee through with their swords. Stop there. Let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your love to us, mercy and grace and watch care over us. We are extremely thankful for the time that you've given us to come into the house of the Lord as our brother has prayed to uh, hear your word and to sing and to fellowship with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we pray, Father, for those that are unable to be with us, and we ask, Lord, that I watch care uh, to be with them and that you bless them in a great way, bring them back at the next appointed time. I ask, Father, that you would continue to, to, to be with uh, all of the needs that have been made known unto the church. We uh, do think of Sister Kyger at this time and for uh, Martha, uh, also battling with cancer. Lord, we pray that you would just be with them and, and bless and, and uh, give peace and understanding. And uh, Lord, I ask that you be with me tonight as I servant. May you give me liberty and ability to present thy word tonight in truth and in love and clarity of mind. And Father, I pray that if there are any here that know you not as Savior, that know you not as Lord and Savior, that this would be the day of salvation, that they would come to know you in the full pardon and forgiveness of sin. I ask, Father, that you lead us now and guide us, help us to do that which is right and pleasing in thy sight. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I think you may be seated. So picking back up in Ezekiel, uh, after taking last week off, we already know a couple of things about this chapter. So Ezekiel chapter 16 is, is the longest chapter in the book of Ezekiel, um, and, and the, other, the next longest is chapter 23, but this is the story of Israel's sin and unfaithfulness to the love of God, and it is taking us through Israel's infancy. When God chose her, when she was in sin, and, and of course that's all of us, right? God chose us before the foundation of the world, but it takes us through her infancy, to her faithfulness and following after God, and then through her years of unfaithfulness. And of course, in the Old Testament, that Old Testament picture of a husband and wife, and that is uh, God to the nation of Israel. And so uh, that is why we read so much of the whoredom in this, and that of the harlot and the committing of abomination. So Ezekiel is going through and having to literally call out individual, well, I mean, call out very specific sins that Israel was involved in. And that's 
Well, we've been studying in chapter 16, so as I said, it's just really one of these where the verse is read. I've only got a few comments on each verse because they all really tell this same story or this same chronological history. Some of them we'll, we'll be able to branch off a little bit on, but really it is just that. It is just the calling out, and when I say just that, not lightly, it is the calling out of Israel's sin um, throughout her time as a nation. As I stated before when we started this, and I think this is at least our, our third message within chapter 16, or second or third, I should have looked at that, but uh, when we started this, uh, again, while the history of America is not recorded within the, the Word of God, except to know that uh, we'll be judged, um, you, you can look the history of the nation of Israel and you can see a lot of similarities to our own country. So I want you to pay, pay close attention to those similarities uh, to the nation and people of Israel and that of us here in the United States. Well, coming back into this now, in verses 31 through 34, it shows that it is wicked to solicit and then be paid for immorality. Israel engaged in very bad behavior. She solicited and even paid her idol consorts. Paid her idol or just paid for the idols. Israel paid for the godless nation they now were. Verse 31 again it says, And in that thou buildest, sorry, in that thou buildest thine enemy place, and the head of every way, and makest thine high place in every street, and has not, and has not been as an harlot, and that thou scornest higher. She's giving herself to strangers, very deep in her sin. They're sinning. They're not even paying for all of the sin. They're freely running after these false gods. Running after the false gods instead of following after God. That's what verse 32 is. But as a wife that committed adultery, which taketh strangers instead thereof, instead of her husband, excuse me. But as a wife that committed adultery, which taketh strangers instead of her husband. So that picture, again, of that relationship of of husband to wife that God had with Israel. And Israel is, is running after these false gods and committing adultery and abominations and idols and taking these strange things instead of God and going after these wicked, wicked ways. And that certainly was, and that is the picture of, of idols and idolatry and, adul and adultery as well. Idolatry and adultery. It always leaves pain and grief generally ends in disaster. Here it will end in judgment. Verse 33, They gave gifts to all whores, but thou givest thy gifts to all thy lovers, and hirest them, that they may come unto thee on every sign for thy whoredom. Generally speaking, a whore is paid for their whoredom. There's no prettier way of saying it than that. And so what this is basically telling us is that the sins of Israel had become so terrible they were actually paying for the affairs themselves. That Israel is seeking out the false gods herself even though they had nothing to offer. That's how deep they were in the sin. And I'm going to talk about the, the deepness of sin in a little bit. And then verse 34, And the contrary is in thee from other women in thy whoredoms, whereas none followeth thee to commit whoredoms, and in that thou givest a reward, and no reward is given unto thee, therefore thou art contrary. Well, I want you to turn over as we think about this verse to 2 Kings chapter 16 and verse 8. 2 Kings chapter 16 and verse 8. Well, we will see is this very thing is speaking of uh, that of Ahaz, who was also an evil king. He was not faithful to God and caused the people to fall away from God as well. In 2 Kings 16, and we'll just read verse 8. And Ahaz took the silver and gold that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasures of the king's house and sent it 
for a present to the king of Assyria. So he got rid of the things of God as well. Just as they were doing here. Verse 35. Wherefore, O harlot, hear the word of the Lord. That's a harsh name. That's a harsh name to call Israel. But that was the place they were at. As I said, many rabbis, if you, they would not, they, they, they don't read this because of how painful it is to hear God's chosen people called that. As I said, Ezekiel is delivering this message and he was calling out these very specific sins of adultery and idolatry and whoredom. So here's the nation of Israel. Again, going throughout the history here, is what, that's what chapter 16 has been cataloging for us. God's chosen people, God's special people, pictured as the, the bride, or not really the bride, pictured as the wife, would be a bride. That beautiful relationship. Countries around Israel knew about Israel and knew that they, they followed after God, at least partially, not like they would have in today's world with all the technology that we have, but they've known about the Jews. They've known about them. So very, very direct word. Very convicting word. This is the place they were at as being compared to an unfaithful wife. And God calls out sin no matter who it is. Sin is still sin. Adultery and whoredom is always wrong. No matter who it is. And so God calls it out. Wherefore, O harlot, hear the word of the Lord. You need to, to, to listen to this. Verse 36, Thus saith the Lord God, Because thy filthiness was poured out, and thy nakedness discovered through whoredoms with thy lovers, and with all the idols of thy abominations, and by the blood of thy children, which thou didst give unto them. This goes back, this reminds us of what we've already learned a little bit. But these are very specific things that they have done that show their unfaithfulness to God. The lovers in this sense are the evil nations they sign treaties with. We as God's children are to be what? We are called to we are to be separated from the world. Well, we're in the world, but we are not of the world. Amen. And that's the way that it was supposed to be for the children of Israel, for the nation of Israel, that they are in the world, but they're not of the world. They, are, they, they were separate. They were called apart. But they had thrown themselves in with the world. They had thrown themselves in with the enemies. They had thrown themselves in with the wolves, so to speak. They have committed the abominations. Over and over again, we've studied that. We've learned that. They've chosen the way of the world over God. I'm not saying anything new to you. With the idols and with the abominations. It's so hard to imagine when you, you know the history of Israel, when you know the rich history of Israel, when you, when you start in Genesis and you understand the, the covenant that God made with Abraham, and then you, you go through and you see God's protection of it. Well, and again, even before that, when God chose into Israel in their infancy, and then the covenant that was made, and then you go through you know, with Moses and the Exodus and how God preserved them and how God protected them in the wilderness. Just all of these things. Beloved, that's how quick sin can distort even the most faithful to God. They went the way of the world. They even sacrificed their own children to these false gods, as we learned a couple of weeks ago. You've heard the quote, Sin will always take you much further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. And the sin of adultery is sick and grotesque before God. And it, in this picture that God gives us, when you think about the husband-wife relationship and what it pictures, 
and how adultery tears apart and wounds couples here on earth so much the more as this was committed against God. This adulterous relationship. Now, God says He is a jealous God. We learn that from Exodus. And as an earthly husband, if our wife were to commit adultery, we would have that, that jealousy. We would it would be a horrific feeling. And of course, the feeling would go the other way. But in the picture again, here, husband to wife. God would not tolerate this unfaithfulness anymore. This is where the judgment of God comes. Oh, verse 37. Behold, therefore I will gather all thy lovers with whom thou hast taken pleasure, and all them that thou hast loved, and all them that thou hast hated. I will even gather them round about against thee, and will discover thy nakedness unto them, that they may see all thy nakedness. The very nations that they turn to would be the very nations that would turn against them. The very nations. The way of the world that they went to, the allies that they made, or the very nations that would see and that God would use. It would tear them apart. Verse 38. And I will judge thee as women that break wedlock. And I will shed blood, and shed blood are judged. And I will give thee blood in fury and jealousy. The women who broke wedlock were stoned to death. That was the culture. Their punishment would fit their crime, and God will judge and have vengeance upon them. God will, for their unfaithfulness. Verse 39, And I will also give thee into their hand, and they shall throw down thine intimate place, and shall break down thy high places. They shall strip thee also of thy clothes, and shall take thy fair jewels, and leave thee naked and bare. Essentially, what this would describe is that the nation of Israel would be back to the condition that they were found in. All of the gifts that God had given them will be taken away. They will be naked, bare, and even unclothed. That's when God would first found them humiliated for the wrong that they had done. Verse 40. They shall also bring up a company against thee, and they shall stone thee with stones, and thrust thee through with their swords. And this very thing that does happen to them when they are invaded, they are killed by the sword. The killing of these people is symbolic of the punishment for a harlot wife by stoning to death. I, I, I cannot imagine what this must have been like to deliver. Can I know I, I relate this a lot, but I think that burden of Ezekiel is what really needs to burden us ministers today. When we, when we, we need to talk very real about the judgment of God, right? When we say that Paul was stoned and he was left for dead, and we say, okay, well, Paul was stoned and he's left for dead. Do you understand the, the immense amount of pain that would have come from a stoning? So much so that Paul looked dead and then they drug him out. So these that are being judged are going to be stoned. And I say all that to say this, here's this burden, and here's this message that God is giving to Ezekiel to talk about the judgment of God that will come to Ezekiel, or I'm, I'm sorry, to the nation of Israel for her sin. And when I talk about the burden of judgment and the burden of these things, the time is coming when sinners will be judged and they will spend eternity in the lake of fire. And that eternity in the lake of fire will hurt more than any amount of physical pain you can think of here on this earth. The torments that the Bible speaks of, of the judgment that is for sin, that will be for all eternity, will 
will cause more pain and anguish physically than we can even begin to imagine. I couldn't imagine the pain of being stoned to death. I can't imagine the pain of, uh, of being burnt. I can't begin to fathom what that would feel like. I, I don't even like to get a hangnail. I, I don't like to get uh, a pinch on my finger. I don't like it when I do those things. And those are extraordinarily mild to the judgment that was being or that would be poured out upon Israel and mild in comparison to the eternal judgment of sinners. It is not a fun thing to stand before people and tell them about that judgment. It's one thing to do it, or how do I want to say this? It's hard enough to do it within the confines of a worship service, but something else completely to go out into the world and tell people about their sin. So, anyway, I say all that to say that this was a very, very serious punishment. All right, verse 41. And they shall burn thine houses with fire and execute judgment upon thee in the sight of many women. And I will cause thee to cease from playing the harlot. And thou also shalt give no hire anymore. When God is through with this fire, what we, what we do gather here is the ones left will be faithful to him. They are the remnant that he saves. We talked about that remnant. After the judgment, I will cause thee to cease from playing the harlot. And thou shalt give no hire anymore. So verse 42 goes along with that. So will I make my fury toward thee to rest. And my jealousy shall depart from thee. And I will be quiet. And will be, and be no more angry. God's forgiveness is awesome. God's anger, which is righteous and justified. Understand that God's anger is a holy, righteous anger. And it is justified. But even that anger lasts for just a while. When the stoning is over, or by the full penalty of Israel's sin has been come to pass, God's wrath will be satisfied. Now for us today, you know what I will say. God's wrath for our sin was satisfied when the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified upon the cross at Calvary. For us today that have come to know the Lord Jesus Christ and been forgiven of our sins, we can know that our sins have been paid for by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that God's forgiveness is awesome. God poured out His wrath for my sin upon His Son. God shows here His awesome forgiveness. Well, verse 43, I mean, we still go on. It's still hard to hear the rest of this message. But it, because thou hast not remembered the days of thy youth, but hast fretted me in all these things, behold, therefore I will also recompense thy way upon thine head, saith the Lord God, and thou shalt not commit the lewdness above all thine abominations. That word lewdness is a heinous crime. It's not just a sin, but one that brings revulsion. And, and God is bringing to the remembrance. You know, God desires that Israel would remember her first love and turn back to God. Remember the punishment that God gives is just. Verse 44 and 45, Behold, every one that useth Proverbs shall use this proverb against thee, saying, As is thy mother, so is her daughter. That art, thou art thy mother's daughter, that loatheth her husband and her children. And thou art the sister of thy sisters, which loathe their husbands and their children. Your mother was an Hittite, and your father 
an Amorite. This is just saying this will not be soon forgotten. This punishment reaches to the second generation, and that Judah had followed in the pagan footsteps of her beginning. It appears from this that the unfaithfulness had gone on for at least two generations, that they had taken up the ways of their mothers. And there were many evil kings who led people into spiritual adultery in Israel before God brought captivity and death to them in punishment for their unfaithfulness. All right, now moving on to another phase of Israel's history, we come to verses 46 through 59. And in these verses, we see that Judah is compared to Samaria and Sodom, whose judgment for sin was great. Judah was corrupt. We'll see that in verse, or we saw that in, uh, we'll see that in verse 47. And it multiplied Samaria's and Sodom's sin in verse 51. And they committed abominable sin in verse 52. Well, let's talk about it. Verse 46. And thine elder sister is Samaria, she and her daughters that dwell at thy left hand, and thy younger sister that dwelleth at thy right hand is Sodom and her daughters. This is speaking of the evil neighbors that they've been involved in. These are the ones that they signed the treaties with. This is the way of the world in which Israel went. This is what Israel had been involved in. Sodom was, and still is, a symbol of evil because of the total destruction God had brought upon Sodom and Gomorrah for their homosexual activities. And Israel would have been very familiar with Sodom and Gomorrah. The teachings of Sodom would have been very, very familiar to Israel. Really, the teaching of the Sodom and Gomorrah should be very familiar for us today, but if you were to ask the average American what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah, they wouldn't be able to answer. And sadder than that, if you were to ask the average Christian what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah, they probably wouldn't be able to answer. But I'll tell you this, Israel knew of Sodom. They knew the evil of Sodom, and they knew why God had judged them, and they knew what, it, what, what the sin that happened there. And so God called out and said, you have... Come to your sisters, your neighbors, make treaties with them, and they are involved in all of these sexual horrific sins. This could also be speaking of the exiled Jews who lived in these areas. Now verse 47, Yet hast thou not walked after their ways, nor done after their abominations, but as if that were a very little thing, that was corrupted more than they in all thy ways. Their sin is their sin, and you may not have Israel done everything that they did, that Samaria did, but here's the difference. You knew better. Now, it doesn't say it like that, but they did know better. They were brought up better. They knew the law of God. They heard the law of God. Now the way of the world and sinners of the world, they're going to stand in judgment for their sin. Make no mistake about that. But Israel knew. And that's why God says, well, to me, that that was a very little thing. Thou was corrupted more than they in all thy ways. Corrupted more than they in all thy ways. Israel had been unfaithful to God because, well, they, they fell in sin. I want you to listen to these words in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 17. I relate this a little bit to today, if I can. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 17, it says, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if they first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Judgment must begin at the house of God. We will not be above to escape the teachings that God has given us through His word. And at his house. 
We as God's children know what we are to do. And judgment must begin at the house of God. They knew better. We have been taught and God holds us accountable to that which we know. <laughs> now again, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You understand that. But what God teaches us in this book and when He reveals to us as we read and as we study and as we hear it preach, we are held accountable to. Israel had learned and they knew the law. And yet they fell into this deep sin and were unfaithful to God. They were held accountable to it. It says over there in the book of Proverbs chapter 22, talking about this accountability. In Proverbs chapter 22, it says in verse 6 through 8, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he, was old, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he shall not depart from it. We are not able to depart from the teachings of God's word, and they're now going to be judged for their disobedience. And no one can protect them. No one can stop the judgment of God. Ezekiel was out warning and calling out the sin that they committed. But the judgment of God will come. Well, I'll read to you verses 48 and 49, and we'll, we'll stop after that and finish up the chapter next week, the Lord willing. Or the week after. As I live, saith the Lord God, Sodom thy sister hath not done, she nor her daughters as thou hast done, thou and thy daughters. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. Sodom may not have committed all the same sins as Israel. They were sisters in sin, however. And then it talks about sin many times springs up from having too much free time, too much idleness. They did not have to work. <laughs> they, they had plenty of bread. They had plenty of things. But the idle mind comes up with new ways to sin. That's why we must remain working for the Lord. We are, when we're idle, sin oftentimes takes over. I'm reminded of the verse that we just studied in Ephesians chapter 5. I read to you verse 16 through 18. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. I'm reminded of that. We need to be filled with the Spirit of God. That's what we're talking about. We need to redeem the time. We need to take time to pray. We need to take time to worship. We need to take time to share the gospel. Take time to be holy. Take time to read the Bible. And take time to honor the Lord. Every day. People would not have thought, I know this is weird, they would not have thought about Israel falling into sin. God's chosen people. We've heard, you've heard stories or truths about People that are committed and closely following after Christ. And it, it baffles our mind when they fall into a deep sin. The, the sin of sodomy, the sin of uh, murder or adultery or whatever it is. And we think, no way, not that person. That would have been a thought. That would have been a thought that would have probably even crossed the minds of, of some of those that Israel signed the treaties with. Really, you? You're going to join with us? Let us ever be mindful that we are what we are by the grace of God. And may God help us to remain faithful to His Word. I'll stop with that. All right. Thank you for your attention to the Word of God. Let's stand together. And we'll be dismissed in prayer.